What's going on, everyone? You're listening to the My Aggie Nation podcast. I'm Alex Miller with the Eagle. We've got an all-Eagle crew today. We've got Travis L. Brown. What's going on, Travis? How's it going, Alex? Oh, it's it's going well. It's a little chilly, but, you know, we got the flannel on, so that's all good. But um, And, of course, we've got the one and only Robert Cessna. What's going on, Cease? It's Pennsylvania weather. Enjoy it. <laughs> welcome to, 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 to a little bit of, welcome to today's edition of what is Alex wearing? <laughs> yep. Well, the colder weather means it's basketball season and um well, Anum Anum men's hoops, they played a pretty thrilling game Wednesday night at Reed Arena falling to Kentucky 64 to 58, but you know, for a while there it looked like Anum might have had a chance to to pull off an upset which would have been their best win of the season. Ultimately, though, Kentucky, a little too talented. a and couldn't hit the clutch shot down the stretch. Um, but, you know, with that said, Travis, what would you kind of make of a and performance against Kentucky? This was, this was kind of a measuring stick game in some regard. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because there's, there's something that a and has done really bad, and there's something that a and has done really well this year. Really bad – uh, is the fact that they can't hit free throws. In fact, if you want to look at Ken Palm's uh, recording of stats, Ken Pomroy's, a and is the 10th to last in f- uh, free throw percentage at 63%. However, they entered yesterday's game as the best three-point shooting uh, team in the SEC at about uh, 37%. Both, yesterday, they couldn't hit free throws or three-pointers, which was weird. I know Buzz said, he didn't think it was the case, but it, it seemed pretty obvious that AM's team was pretty jacked up by the, the atmosphere and the crowd, the amazing uh, record setting crowd that was at Reed Arena last night. And, and it seemed like they were kind of overshooting a, a bunch of those three pointers that they were uh, uh, really good at. They actually went one for 22 from three point range, or it could have just been the fact that Robert Sesta made his first appearance at a men's basketball game yesterday that they were jacked up about. Cease, what did you see? Well, I, I think you're right. I think you got to take the good with the bad. I think they were jacked up. I think when you asked Buzz a great question and, and I, I had a chuckle to myself, of course they were a little more jacked up. And I think anytime what affects your shots, your adrenaline, you're too jacked up or you're too tired. And Kentucky goes through that every time they go out. So they're, they're used to handling that. I think A&M played great defense. I was so impressed with the effort what they did with the big guy inside. I was impressed with Cash for seeing him the first time in person. Uh, uh, what was the other guy's name? Uh, you, have to, you have to bear with me right now. Henry Coleman. The Coleman. Mm-hmm. But, but my point being is uh, they only needed to make two or three plays and, and they beat Kentucky. And, and to me, it would have been no fluke how hard they played and how well they played and had the game plan. Now I got to chuckle. What do they have to do? to make sure the fans and cease come back because they earned what they got last night. But how do you build on that? Because now you've got to go to Arkansas and do the same thing. You've got to beat South Carolina when maybe there's only 8,000 there, because if you could do that, you'll get back to those moments. And that was a special moment because that's what basketball fans want to see on a regular basis at Reed Arena. I, I will say, and this is something I asked Buzz a couple weeks ago, that not only is this a and not only does winning bring fans and put butts and seat in seats seats in Reed Arena, but there's a, there's certain brands of basketball that are a little more conducive towards um, excitement and attention. And I think that actually this team has that, and it's that we're we're gonna go out there and steal the ball and, and do have a lot of transition buckets, have a lot of dunks have a lot of high flying flying at, uh, uh, parts of the game. You got a guy like Wade Taylor who isn't afraid to make a behind the back pass. You uh, typically have a team that's able to hit a lot of three pointers. Those are things that usually excite a crowd, get a game, get a crowd into a game and things that fans that it's a kind of game that fans want to watch and which is actually a stark contrast to what the a and men's basketball team has been the last two years, which has been very grinded out, get to the end of the shot clock, minimize possessions. It, it's a very, it, it's like a uh, uh, two yard, three yards in a cloud of dust, old SEC kind of football that people just don't want to watch anymore. And so I think that 
even if even with this loss with Kentucky, that's the kind of uh, of of offense that might generate a crowd. Alex, what do you think? What did you see from your your angle from the stands yesterday? Yeah, you know, I got to I got to be a spectator at the game Wednesday night, and you know the energy the energy was there. You know, I've been I've been to a lot of games at Reed Arena, a lot of a lot of games similar to that where where the crowd is big and the crowd is really into it. Um, that was definitely the most energetic that I've seen Reed Arena in a long time. And, you know, I think Buzz mentioned it, how he, he wanted to be a little more involved in maybe the marketing and getting out there and getting fans roped into to coming to the games. And I think if, if they can continue to do that, that's going to go a long way for them, you know, kind of having that atmosphere that, that they've envisioned uh, having for the last couple of years. You know, obviously last year they had the crowd restrictions uh, due to the pandemic, but, you know, you look at the schedule – Um, in about three weeks, they're going to host LSU on a Tuesday night. Um, that's probably going to be the, the biggest game at home left on the schedule. You know, if, if A&M can go and win a few games the next couple weeks, um, and, and still be relevant, you know, that, that's going to go a long way to getting a crowd that's similar of that stature. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if they'll be able to top the largest crowd in Reed Arena history, but, you know, they could certainly get 10,000 plus uh, fans into the game and you know the student turnout was what was really impressive to me was was that that that, that section there there were hardly any there were empty seats were few and far between and so the buy-in from the students was big and the fact that they were giving away free tickets and there was all the promotions that was big um, we'll see if 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 they can if they can get some return fans from that in, in the coming weeks though. Alex, I'll, I want to throw this at you too, since you were actually up kind of in the concourse area. Um, I, a lot of rumors and, and people talking out there that a lot more students than they had student seats got left in and they were standing room only and people in the concourse. What did the concourse scene look like? Because we have another media entrance where we don't really go through the concourse. Yeah, you know, it was definitely jammed packed. And, you know, when Aiden missed that final three-pointer, everybody got up and left at once. And getting out of the door was pretty tricky, let me tell you. Um, but I heard, too, that there were people that got turned away from getting into the game because there weren't enough seats and there were more people trying to get in than there was room for. I mean, that's how, that's how many people wanted to come to this game. Um, and so, you know... If a and able to replicate something like that, that'd be big. You know, I, I think a few years ago when Ben Simmons was playing at LSU, they I think that was really the largest crowd at Reno Arena when they had students sitting in the in the aisles. Um, they went over the fire code. The rumors have it there was over 15,000 people in the arena that night. You know, if a can win some games, maybe they got a crowd similar to that uh, against LSU when they come back to town. LSU is a really good team. Um, but it was definitely a madhouse inside Arena Arena. And I know, Cease, you had a really difficult time getting to the arena itself. Yeah, a couple of things you, you guys touched on. I left Eagle at 7.05. I was a little bit late. And so I said, okay, I'll get there at 7.30, no problem. I got to the car at 8.05. And, and as you mentioned, I got there with, I think it was 6.59 to go in the first half. But in, anyway, you touched on it. They were, they were turning people away because I was walking up. I had a pass, so other people couldn't get in. And, and another thing that Travis hit on, which I've talked before, I guess, you know, when you looked at this team from a distance talking to other media in, in, in town, this was not probably going to be an exciting team to watch, but they were going to grind it out on defense, maybe win some 50 game, 56 to 52 games. But, but you touched on it. This is an exciting team to watch for the brand of defense they have in offense. And you think if they could only hit about three more threes because a three-pointer gets a crowd into it and they only hit one out of 22. I was sitting over by the band and a lot of students behind and I could, I could hear them cursing a few times when the three-pointers went up. If they could have hit one of those, the people around me were ready to explode, but they, they never had a chance to do it for the three-pointer. Yeah, and you know, that's 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 kind of a sign of some, some people who may not have been able to come out to some of these men's basketball games this year because this is a team that's probably going to live and die by the three, especially if they can't 
make free throws. You know, the past couple of years, AM has been able to uh, mitigate some of their shooting deficiencies by getting to the free throw line. Well, this isn't a team that can necessarily do that. They've been able to do that stay in games and win games by hitting threes and being one of the best three point shooting teams in the country. So if they don't have the three pointer and they don't have the free throw line, it's going to be hard to win some games. Now credit to them for being able to stay that close in a game shooting. What was it? Four for five for 13 at the free five for 13. Th- mm-hmm. at the th- th- free throw line and one for 22 from a uh, three point range. They did a good job. And it really was that those transition buckets and their defense that that helped keep them in the game. That's going to be the MO of this team moving forward. And if they have more nights like this where they are, you, you might say that the crowd was great and, and the atmosphere and whatever, but this was a team that has played in front of 2,000, 3,000 people most of the season, and they've been a great three-point shooting team. I'm not saying that crowd should go away, but if it does <laughs> kind of regulate back down to – you know, a 6,000, 8,000 person crowd at South Carolina when they uh, come back on the 29th, it might help them kind of ease back in. But they went from, you know, what was it? It was probably 5,000 against um, Arkansas and, and the players were all excited and saying it was it was lit in there uh, and, and going to, you know, a capacity 14,000 person crowd where they're real jacked up, they might need to build back up to that a little bit more and, and it might help their shooting and help just that general adrenaline rush. You know, Travis, yeah. Travis, you mentioned how a and kind of ride or died by the three. The guy that stuck out to me last night, though, was Henry Coleman and just, just his presence down there at the low block. You know, how valuable has he been to this team and, and what you really make of his night, especially, you know, him going toe-to-toe against Oscar Shibe, Shibe uh, from Kentucky, who's one of the best rebounders in the entire country. Good, good effort on on that that pronunciation. I, I don't know exactly Shibway. what it is. That is right, think, Oscar Shibwe. I, I hey, nailed it. There we better go. Better than better than the two of us can do. Um, yeah, he actually is the number one um, uh, rebounder in 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 the country for for uh, rebounds per game, offensive rebounds per game, and total rebounds. Uh, he's a six five guard uh, from the Congo. Um, just an absolute force, a lot of projections that he could be an, a, a player of the year uh, type of guy. And, and, and it's just, and as you, we heard Aaron Cash say last night, a guy whose main focus, who uh, is rebounding, that that was the focus of, of his game was just eliminate him as much as he can. He was still able to get 14 rebounds, but um, yeah, Henry Coleman. So, so most of a offense is predicated on paint touches, whether that be dribble penetration, they have, a, a number of guards who can get into the paint and get the ball out to three point shooters. And that's where they've been able to get a lot of, of their scoring. But when that three point game isn't there or when teams want to get out and guard the three point uh, against AM, Henry Coleman has been a force down low, uh, uh, getting some of those passes. And, and the thing that actually stood out to me about his game last night, he's been the AM's leading scorer in. Uh, four of their five SEC t- games this this year. The thing that stood out about this game, maybe more so than the other ones, is his actual ability to um, create off the dribble uh, down low. They, he got some balls because they had some trouble at times getting that dribble penetration. He got some passes right there in in the wood area, the the, the kind of mid range jumper area, and he was able to actually take a couple of dribbles and make a spin move down low that led to uh, some buckets that that necessarily hasn't been. Uh, part of his game frequently through this season. So um, a little bit of a development on that there, but he's been um, kind of the heart and soul of the offense. And the guy that Buzz Williams has said through the season that they have to have that kind of production from him, both in points and in rebounds that he had last night. But for me, the guy that, that stood out, um, Cease, you can you, you mentioned him earlier, was, and I said it, Aaron Cash. He's a Juco transfer, a guy that like at the beginning of the season, Buzz Williams said, is one of those guys that might not even be getting that that many practice reps because he's just that 11th man out on a lot of things, but he has been told from the get-go he's the energy guy and he's the rebounding guy. And his effort last night against, uh, I'll we'll just go with Oscar, um, was was monumental in them being able to stay in that game. Cease, I know you you mentioned him as well. Um, what you know from a guy who's watched a lot of games on TV? Um, what did you think about some of these individual guys um, that that you've seen because they did completely remake the roster from last year. 
Yeah, that's what I was looking for because uh, I saw it on the women's side a little bit too. When you add like nine guys, whatever Buzz did, and uh, we knew that they had a more talent, but having talent and playing together and getting results is something different. But I was so impressed with the athleticism of so many of their players, as you mentioned, Coleman and Cash. But not only just do you have athleticism, but they were able to frustrate Kentucky several times. You could see, and the fans really got into that, the fact that you put all these uh, people together. And so you have to give Buzz and his staff credit for not only – recruiting the right people through the transfer portal, but getting them to play the way they did last night, which to me is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, where they're at right now, because we, we, we've talked before, Travis, this is like they're starting over. This is almost like, like Buzz's first year, what, what happened the last two years. With that in mind is you've got to be awfully excited about where this program is going, what you saw last night from those players like me walking up for really the first time because, heck, I don't even remember who was on the team two years ago when I watched because it's it's been a revolving door. But when you see the players, and I get it, I read your stories and everybody's about, all oh, they play together, they do all this. But you actually could see that on the court last night. I'd like to watch them a little more in person to see how Buzz does his uh, – you know, uh, you know, uh, goes ahead and makes the substitutions because I thought at a couple of times their stretches, they weren't able to get enough offense because they probably didn't have the right five on, but I'm not familiar enough with the team. And I know Kentucky's awful good, but just the bottom line is there's a lot to be uh, hopeful for and excited to me if you're an a men's basketball fan because it, it's shades of a la the Billy Gillespie era. And of course, we know Buzz was here, and, and Buzz is an emotional guy, and I, I think that transcends into his players. Well, and, and you mentioned a good point there because it is a really interesting team in the fact, too, that they have probably the most offensive depth that they've had in maybe four years, maybe probably since 2016. It's the most offensive depth that they've had because you kind of look up and down the roster, and yeah, they start Marcus Williams, Andre Gordon, uh, Tyrese Radford, uh, and those, those three guys at guard is Ezra and, and Henry Coleman as, as offensive threats. But uh, you have Quentin Jackson coming off the bench as his kind of designated sixth man who is, is leading the team in scoring. And you look at times, there's times Wade Taylor has been a guy who has led the team in scoring. Uh, you have uh, uh, guys like um, uh, Manny Obaseki coming off and, and giving a good little defensive spark. You, you have scoring up and down that roster. It's just kind of been a matter of who's been on. And they've been lucky that Henry Coleman has been the one consistent guy that's been on uh, uh, through, through the stretch. Now, so here's the thing to look at. And here was kind of the point of my column heading into uh, this game this week. And the fact that I know everybody wanted the big Kentucky win. They wanted uh, the, the ranked win. They wanted to storm the court with 14,000 people. I, 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 I don't, you know, I will say that I'm a little glad we didn't have to deal with a court storming and trying to get to the press conference room and trying to get buzz there and the player that would have been a little bit hectic on deadline. But that being said, th this game ultimately didn't really matter. The ones that AM fans do need to circle is Arkansas next uh, on Saturday away and Alabama away towards the end of the year. I think those are the two games that they maybe could uh, take a win. And, and if you want to run the math on the net rankings and, and where they should probably try to be to be in that tournament field before they get to the SEC tournament, they need two quad one wins. They actually only have one quad one game, and that's talking about roughly – uh, one through 50 in the net rankings. I know home and away has some, some, some differences there, but basically one through 50, they only have one of those. And that was Wisconsin during the Maui Invitational that they lost. Um, and they need more of those quad one, one wins to bolster uh, that NCAA tournament resume. They're going to have now six more chances at quad one games uh, through the season, two at LSU, another away at Arkansas, one against Tennessee, one against Alabama. Um, LSU is a team that that has had some 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 inconsistencies. There there could be a win in one of those two games. Uh, I, I don't. Oh, excuse me, Auburn. I left Auburn. I don't think there's a win at Auburn. I don't think that there's a win at Tennessee. I think Alabama is a team that has shown some inconsistencies. So you win. At Al uh, Arkansas this weekend, you win at Alabama late in the season. I think that's enough. Should they win all those other games that they're supposed to win, 
uh, that, that that should be enough to get them in that field of 64 heading and not having to need an SEC tournament run uh, to get in there. Um, and, and Alex, that's a, that's a little bit of a much different position than they've been in in a really long time. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you think about it, you know, two years ago, that, that first year that Buzz was here, um, you know, A&M was 10 and 8, but they really weren't in contention to, to make the NCAA tournament. Now you're looking at a team, it's, you know, Travis, you documented it in your in your column. They had a pretty easy non-conference slate. They had won four games to start conference play. Arkansas was really the only team worth anything in in those games, though. And so now now it's kind of it's kind of go time. You know, you, you kind of proved yourself on Wednesday that hey, we can compete with the big boys. Now can we go and actually win one of these games? Um, and and ain't them certainly going to have their chances uh, going forward, especially these next three weeks in particular. Yeah, worst uh, worst. According to Ken Palm, it was the worst non-conference schedule um, strength. Is, well, really, total worst strength is schedule coming into last night's game of any Power 5 team in the country. Well, let's kind of pivot now to, to the other team uh, on, the, on the court for AM, the women's team. And Cease, we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of lean on you with this. You know, what, what have you kind of made from, from AM's women's team so far? It seems like it's been kind of an up-and-down year and uh, kind of a def- definitely a tough start to conference play. Yeah, without a doubt, strange times because we're talking about, you know, the AM men have a chance, one or two wins that could go to the NCAA tournament. Uh, for a decade and a half now, the women going to the tournament has been a given, but not this year after the one and four start. And uh, no one is surprised they lost at LSU or lost at South Carolina, lost to South Carolina and Tennessee. The, the big problem was losing to Florida because they already had one bad loss to TCU earlier. So now a and m setting an 11 seed in the uh, projection by Charlie Cream of ESPN. And they still have a lot of huge games left with South Carolina. They got to play LSU again. They got to go to Georgia. They got to go to Kentucky. And they're setting at one and four. a and has never been worse than nine and seven in league play. So you look at tonight's game, uh, I'll be a, a young coach, Gary Blair. This, this is to me is almost a must win game because if you lose to Ole Miss, you drop to one and five and you got to go to Ole Miss again. Suddenly you look at A&M, they'd have a rough time making the tournament in Gary's last year because, uh, you know, I get it. The net rankings are a little bit different this, this year because they do look at uh, this is the second year for them. They, they blow out losses to, to Tennessee don't help you when they lost those. So you look, a and M's going to start winning some big games and Mississippi is a big game. They're, they're 15 and two. They're really good. They're 31 in the net rankings. So it's hard to believe here we are in February. I'm almost talking about a must win for the A&M women because it's a little bit like what Travis said with the men. You can't, you got to take advantage of these because you can't keep pushing it back. You can't go to one and five or one and six or two and six because then how do you win games when the when the conference is so good? So bottom line is this this is this is a big game and this is kind of unusual for AM women this early in the season to have really a must win game at home. Yeah, and if you want to, I know it's kind of early to be looking ahead, but being projected as an 11 seed, that's one or two conference tournament upsets at the mid-major level from being the, one of the first four out um, because that 10 seed is usually where you're sitting as to some of the last at-larges in from major conferences. So, um, yeah, it, it's going to be a kind of a Herculean effort moving forward and a little bit sad that they're having to need, need to have that kind of effort in Gary Blair's last year. Well, you know, and on paper, this team looks good, but we know you don't win games or lose games on paper. And, and you know, a always won those big games, but right now their best win is like over DePaul, and DePaul will make the tournament field. But, man, he's already got two losses to TCU in Florida that are not going to make the, the field. So that's dif- difference in women's side yeah you can go seven and nine and make the tournament because you beat two or three tournament teams well AM Ole Miss is going to probably be a tournament team so that's why it's big for them to win tonight you can't you can't just lose the tournament teams you got to be able to beat some tournament teams they lost to Texas 
was here. It was a non-conference game. In retrospect, that would have been a, a huge victory, but that game wasn't even close down the stretch. So, like I said, it's very unfamiliar, but here's the deal, Travis. We're looking at two things. We're looking at the men's team. They bring in all these newcomers. They blend together real well. Well, the women, they got about th three big transfers. They were able to keep Wells, and they were able to keep Pitts for their, quote, super senior year. But put them together, so far they haven't had that great game against a great opponent. So maybe they're going to, you know, Gary's teams have always jailed late and played well. He's going to have to do it again because they, they need to get some, I don't know about women, about quad win, but they got to beat some teams that you know are going to make the tournament. When, when you look at the a men's team on paper at the beginning when we were talking about this, there was the big question marks on what is the post going to look like? Cause you didn't really know what Henry Coleman, Ethan Henderson, Ajante Brown, some of those guys were going to be. When you look at the women's side, they had a little bit more certainty in that post area on paper, but it seems like that's been one of the major pitfalls of, of the team so far. Without a doubt, because once again, you get the sec and you look at Tennessee, uh, you look at LSU, you look at South Carolina, you got to be strong in the paint. And AM was not strong in the paint and lost all three of those games. And then once again, is they couldn't dominate a team like TCU in the paint. So on paper, they liked Jada Malone, the newcomer. They liked that they got Roby. They liked that they got uh, uh, Patty. They like, like, like these players but they haven't been consistent now when you look at Ole Miss this is why tonight's important Ole Miss's best player is is a WNBA first rounder uh Shakira Austin she plays inside and outside but she's their biggest player six five so you, it's funny I listened to the Ole Miss coach she said yesterday if they could control hold their own in the boards they'll win the game because they're so strong and veteran everywhere else so tonight is a game that AM should do well in the paint or at least hold their own. So once again is, you know, and what's funny is a has got great three-point shooters, but Gary's not a three-point shooting type of guy. He's not going to go out there and have them shoot 30, 35 times a game. They're not like Arkansas. They're going to shoot like, you know, 12 to 15 maybe. And uh, you, make, you make five or six, man, that, that's really good. So, so far – they haven't had that recipe to success. And I get it. They missed Pitts for a few games. They missed other people for COVID, but everybody's battling that. I saw Iowa State got killed last night at home to Texas. Their two best players didn't play. So in, in sports, both sides, men and women basketball, some nights you don't know who's going to show up because of COVID. Yeah. It, we'll, and one more question for those who haven't necessarily been able to follow the women's basketball team that closely. Everyone does know that this is Gary Blair's last season of, of, of the Hall of Fame career. A, what has that kind of looked like so far as he's traveled around the country and, and seen people? And B, in your conversations with him, A, how is he handling that aspect of it just being a, a closing year? Then B, how is he handling it also with the fact that they are having to, to, to really kind of fight through some stuff? Well, Gary wanted, he didn't want it to, to end this way. He thought this would be his last year talking to him, you know, kind of off the record, whatever. And he just want, kind of wanted to have no fanfare, but that's not, not right. You know, when you're, when you've been in the business 50 years, whatever, people want to honor you. So he's been honored everywhere he goes. Uh, even for people playing him at home, you know, Vic brought him some, uh, Vic Schaefer from Texas brought him some boots. Gary's earned that swan song, as they say. I know what is killing him is he's not winning enough. You, when you take that victory lap, you want to have victories, not losses. So he's had too much. He's 11 and six. Last year, they were 25 and three. You know, he wanted to come back. You're feeling like, hey, man, we're 25 and three. We can go 20. 20, maybe 24 and six next year, even better or close to it. Hasn't happened yet. So I think it's, it's a bittersweet thus far. He loves the fact the attention like Van Chancellor called and said, Hey, I'm coming up tomorrow night. He coached at Ole Miss 12 years, but he's coming for Gary, what Gary's done to the game, but that's only going to, when he hugs Chancellor tonight, it's only going to mean a lot. If he wins, if he loses, it's tough to get those con people giving you, Congratulations when you lose a game. So like like us all, Gary's got to win some games. Yeah, and what you know, what, what, I'm real curious where Gary is going to wear those uh, UT boots around Aguilar that he got from Vic Schaefer. I've just you know, 
something something that's uh, crossed my mind. I don't know if if those will be as appreciated at Traditions Club or the you know Grub Burger Bar or wherever he goes. You got to admit, Vic's got a great sense of humor because knowing knowing Gary that uh, Gary would have to wear those once in a while, but uh, those those two guys are characters. They've been together for like what sixteen years or whatever. Uh, and I'm saying to myself, I had a chuckle. Uh, who else could do that besides Vic? Give him, give him Texas. Boots. Yeah, I, I think the casual fan too. I'll, I'll we'll throw this one out there too. I know it's way way early for this, but the casual uh, women's basketball fan and A and M fan is going to want to say, "Well, Vic's got to be the guy next." But of course, he just got locked in at Texas. How, do you see any chance that he abandons the forty acres for Aggieland? You know, Travis, we talk about it all the time. I never say never when coaches are involved, when money's involved, when it's your alma mater involved, because those guys are wired and gals are wired different than us. You don't know what they want. And, you know, if, if A&M could come up with some kind of deal, Vic's got a chance to come to his alma mater. Come on. There was a time where Vic bled the deepest maroon ever. But, you know, when someone throws $9, $10 million at you, you can bleed any color you want to. So, you know, if that chance comes, I would think he'd have to at least listen. But who knows? If he goes to the lead eight this year or something, which he could at Texas, then maybe that's all off. off. But once again, is getting back to what I say, never say never, because I thought at one point it would be a given that he would come back here. But what he went did at Mississippi State, what now he's doing at Texas, he's proven he can win anywhere. So we'll see how that all plays out. Maybe maybe they'll hire Alex. Alex is a young upcoming guy, so hire him. Jay Arnold has really been on Twitter, really been pushing for a coaching job. Maybe it's mostly been football, but who knows? Maybe women's basketball. He could have a little of that in his repertoire. Why not? Why not? Well, that's going to do it for us on today's edition <laughs> of the Miami Nation podcast. Be sure to check theeagle.com for all of our a and hoops coverage of the men's and women's team as they're trying to make their pushes for potential NCAA tournament bids. Um, thanks for tuning in again, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time here on the Miami Nation podcast.